This is an entirely 3D printed quadcopter. And I'm not just talking about the body being printed. Literally everything, including the motors and the pieces that hold everything together were printed. And this thing is massive. Just look at it compared to this normal size quadcopter. From one motor to another, it's 28 inches, which means with the props on it, it'll be over a meter wide. In this video, I'm gonna build almost the whole thing, but for now, let's talk about the motor. Now, in a previous video, I built this version of the motor, which was designed by Christoph Lamer. However, since then, I've made a few upgrades. So quickly, let's go over how this motor works. Inside the motor, there's a core printed from magnetic PLA, which copper wire is wrapped around. Magnets are inserted into the perimeter of this outer housing, which creates a field that the coils interact with when energized. Look at that, wow. Now all these parts of the motor work great. However, up at the front of the motor, there's some room for improvement. In the original design, the propeller is locked onto the motor with this inner locking feature, and then the whole motor is held together with an eight millimeter shaft and collar. This doesn't seem very reliable to me, so I threw out the old design and fixed it. My version uses heat stake inserts and adds some air vents, which will actually pump air into the motor to help with cooling. Now you might be asking, Michael, what happened to that eight millimeter shaft? Well, I traded it for the world's best fastener, the shoulder bolt. Shoulder bolts have a precision ground portion, which will allow the bearings to rotate freely and precisely. And then at the end, they have a threaded portion, which can be used to clamp the motor together. When I disassembled the old motor after testing, I found that the bearing in the front of the motor was starting to wear into the housing. That is not what you want to see right there. All of that is caused by this bearing housing rubbing on it. So I took the opportunity to swap it out for a larger bearing, which should provide more support. Lastly, I added features to the outer diameter of the housing base. This will make assembly and disassembly much easier, and also it just looks cool. Okay, with the motor assembled, we need to test it. First step was to pick up some veggies, then set the motor to 4,000 RPM so you can dice them nicely. After that, collect all the bits that fell into the snow, and put it all directly into a pot and cook on high until you have a very nice soup. So, to do some real testing, I pulled out the same thrust stand I used in my previous testing. I was swapping over some parts to it, and then realized Wait, the load cell on. didn't look right. That is not supposed to look like that. It looks like the top Wheatstone bridge got completely destroyed somehow. Luckily, these things are like eight bucks on Amazon, and Big Jeff will get it to your house in two days. So, I got a new load cell, and I went to put it on. Why is this not working? Oh, they're different size holes. So I was like, no problem. I got plenty of bolts laying around. But that's when I realized the previous and the new load cells don't have the same bolt pattern. At this point, I was getting mildly frustrated and decided just to fix the aluminum plate with a hand drill. But then I realized the motor adapter plate won't work anymore either since there's a new hole spacing. So I had to reprint that. And after all that, finally, we're ready to test. Before we get any further, I want to take a quick second to talk about today's sponsor, PCBWay. If you do projects like me, they offer a wide range of services that you might find helpful. They offer high quality PCBs at really affordable prices, as well as CNC machining and even metal 3D printing. If you don't need metal parts, they can do plastic 3D printing and they can even use high performance plastics like nylon with processes like MJF. Their website makes it really easy to upload your files and get an instant quote. I've used their services several times in the past and had really great experiences. So check them out using the link in the description below. Now in the last video, I already tested the max thrust of this motor. But one thing I noticed was the motor has a very laggy throttle response. To measure this, I wrote some code which tells the motor to start from 10% power and go directly to 100% power. I am sure the ESCs hated this, but luckily nothing exploded. As a baseline, I also did the same test with the biggest off-the-shelf motor that I have. This is definitely not a one-to-one -one comparison because there's a huge size difference and rotational mass difference between these two motors. But listen, I'm still gonna compare them anyway. Looking at the data, the off-the-shelf motor reached its max thrust in 0.8 seconds. However, the 3D printed motor took almost two and a half seconds. I'm not sure if this is because there's just way more rotational mass to accelerate, or if it's a result of not having a ferrite core like off-the-shelf motors. 
Either way, it will definitely impact the performance of the quadcopter, but luckily I think it's good enough. Now this video isn't just about the motor. We're building a quadcopter, right? And what's the most important part of a quadcopter? The arms, of course. It's got four of them. These are the arms for the quadcopter. You will notice that they are very fancy. That is because I used a generative design tool to make them. Now generative design has been around for a while, but it's seen a recent resurgence on YouTube, so I figured I'd give it a shot. The way this worked was I gave the tool a starting shape that looked like this, and I told it to remove as much material as possible while keeping the strength it needed. After all the optimization, I was left with this. Comparing it to the original shape shows just how much was removed. I was really excited with how these turned out. Now these arms are pretty big, so I'm printing them on my Neptune 3 Max, which Elgu was nice enough to send over. And these things printed great, and they're actually pretty strong. All right, let's do a little bit of a strength test. This is really only gonna have to support about three kilograms, but we'll see what it can hold. It's a very uh, scientific test here. All right, so clearly the dovetail portion is the weakest point, which is kind of ironic because that's the only part on here I did design. But just to make sure they could handle the forces from the motor, I went ahead and did a test at max power. Okay, well cool. The motors work, the arms work. Now all I have to do is a lot more printing. Literally so much printing. All told, printing the pieces for this quad used about three kilograms of filament. By far though, the largest print was this center section. It used almost an entire roll of filament and took two days, even though I was printing much faster than normal using Clipper. After two days of printing, look how close this was to running out of filament. This is a brand new spool right before I started. Oh, oh my God, that's heavy. So I got most of the support material out, which is good, but then I realized there were some very unfortunate layer shifts that went on towards the end of the print. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine. I guess, I guess this is what I get for switching to Clipper. Damn it, that sucks. So since these layer shifts cause this to protrude at the end, it means that when I go to insert the arm, it's gonna not go in all the way. So clearly I'm gonna have to reprint this. All right, well that's gonna take at least another two days. But that's all for this video, so subscribe for more, and I'll see you in the next one.